We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. Uh, This this should be our our third and final week in in, uh, chapter 11, talking about faith, uh, talking about uh, the men and women of old who uh, who, who are commended for their faith for a variety of reasons uh, in this chapter, and I just look forward to getting into it with you. So what I think we'll do is we'll We'll pray and, uh, and then start to look at it. Father, thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you that Jesus went to the cross on our behalf. And uh, just wonderful to, to consider it and look at it, sing about it from different perspe- perspectives in those songs this morning. Uh, Lord, we are just grateful that, that our salvation uh, is sure because of what Christ has done on our behalf for those who believe. Uh, so, Lord, as we look into Hebrews chapter 11 this morning and discuss further what it means to have faith, I pray that you'd open our eyes uh, to see and our hearts to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so in the, in the first part of, of chapter 11, uh, we looked at uh, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah Uh, And they were all commended for their faith because they weren't just caught up with their circumstances, what they were dealing with in life, but they were also uh, looking ahead to a better country, to a better home, to a heavenly home. And uh, and so they were... They were uh, looking forward to what God had promised to them. And then uh, last week we looked at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And, and in, in this chapter anyways, they're kind of focusing on the fact that these guys, despite their shortcomings, they believed the promise that God had given to Abraham. And that was that uh, Ab- from Abraham would come a people, uh, they would possess a land, and that they would both receive God's blessing and that they would be a blessing. And so we looked at the faith that was involved there. And so before we um, continue this morning, uh, because we're going to see it again this morning and we've seen it before, I just want to make sure it's been emphasized that they were commended for their faith in God, what God had said, how God had revealed himself, what God had promised. Their faith was not in what they wanted, There's a big difference, and sometimes we can confuse the two. So for example, in both the Old and the New Testament, God promises, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, right? Or in Romans chapter 8, towards the end of the chapter, Paul goes to great lengths uh, to come to this conclusion. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So these are promises that God gives. These are the types of things that we have faith in. God said it. God promised it, so we believe it to be true. So we need to be careful that we're not putting our faith in things that God hasn't promised to us. Uh, We we realize that in life, um, there's disappointment. There are hard times. There's conflict between people. Uh, There is sickness. Uh, Not everyone's uh, Fortune 500 uh, on the Fortune 500 list, or even close to it. So I'm just wondering where food is coming from uh, for tomorrow. So we're not we're not promised the absence of troubles in this life. So in fact, in in James says, don't be surprised when you experience various types of trials. But he also said that he would be with us in the trials. So in in verse 34, we'll get to it in a minute. Uh, there's this, this little phrase uh, he's mentioning. Uh, uh, he basically says, I don't have time to talk about everyone, but there's all kinds of other people I could talk about. And he says, those who, were, uh, quenched, those who quenched the power of fire, which I think is a, a reference to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and, and if you remember their story, they were um, Israelites taken captive. They're in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar builds this golden... Um, idol and, and says to, to everyone, uh, you know, has, brings everybody out and says, when you hear the music play, you will bow down to the idol. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow down, so they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar. And basically, Nebuchadnezzar said, look, you're going to bow down, or I'm going to throw you in this burning furnace. And they said, well, we're not going to bow down. And so he's... Um, 
Nebuchadnezzar says, well then, you know, in, into the furnace you go. So, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, this is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So these guys were acting in obedience. They had the Ten Commandments, right? They, they were not to uh, have graven images. They were not to bow down or worship uh, any idols. They, that uh, God would be their God. There'd be no other God before him. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed, they had faith that obedience to God was more important than any edict of any king or ruler or, or anyone else. Does that mean that God had to deliver them from the fiery furnace? It didn't mean that. But they said, God, we know you're able to, and even if you don't, we have faith that obedience to you is the most important thing. Terrible situation that they found themselves in, um, and yet they had faith not in the circumstance, but in their God, and in God's promises, in God's word, in the fact that they believed God that if they were obedient to him, that God would, God's will would be done. And of course, we, we do know in that situation, they were delivered. So we are to bring request to God with confidence, uh, knowing that he'll be faithful to his promises, confident that he's good, that he loves us, he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us, but never with the idea that just because we want it, that God will do it for us, if it's not something that he's promised to do. Okay, so faith, it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, in the beginning of the chapter, these guys had faith in a heavenly home. Uh, and then last week, they had faith in the promises to Abraham. Um, and this week, we're looking at more uh, really from the time of the Exodus, Moses and forward. Again, having faith that God had promised them a land and that they would uh, end up in this land. So let's, let's just start to read. We're just going to take it a, a verse or two at a time. Uh, Hebrews 11, starting verse 23. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So Moses was born uh, during a time when the Israelites were growing in number uh, and probably even prosperity in the land of Egypt. Uh, they were doing very well. And this, this Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, uh, was looking at them and thought, man, these guys they're strong, they're numerous, they're grow maybe they were growing faster. They're thinking, these guys could be a real problem. And so he, uh, he um, put out this edict that all the male uh, Hebrew ch children were to be killed at birth. Well, we've, we've read in the scripture just a, a few weeks ago from, from Genesis chapter 9, after they came out of the ark, that God said there would be a reckoning for life. They knew that God valued life, and so they believed what God said about life over what the Pharaoh said about killing the firstborn, and they hid Moses in faith, um, perhaps having similar mindset to Peter and the apostles who said to the high priest in the Sanhedrin, we must obey God rather than men. So by faith, Moses' parents uh, hid him in the reeds. In verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses, so he was, his, his, his parents said, we're not going to, we're going to make sure this baby isn't killed. They were hiding him in the reeds by the river. Moses, or excuse me, Pharaoh's daughter 
uh, comes across him there and brings him into her home and raises him in her home. Basically, in, in Pharaoh's courts, Moses was raised. Uh, Josephus, who's a first century Jewish historian, he said that Moses was a general in the Egyptian army. He had won several battles and he was next in line to the throne. He was next in line below Pharaoh. Now that's not a biblical source, but it is, uh, it's interesting to think that Moses was a strong and powerful uh, Egyptian man. But he also knew that he was of Hebrew descent. He was, a, he was an Israelite. He was of Hebrew descent. And he saw the injustice being done to his own people. One day he decides, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. So I don't know if he decided that one day, but he comes across this situation and he acted. And so he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave and he thought, this isn't right. So he uh, killed the Egyptian, buried him somewhere in the sand, scripture says. Uh, And he thought, no one, he thought, nobody, nobody's seen me. Nobody knows I'm, I'm going to be okay. And I don't know that this was in his, his intention, but on that day he aligned himself with God's people rather than with the Egyptian uh, up, upbringing that he had. But I want to just um, look at this one phrase here in verse 24, or maybe the, yeah, the verse 24. By faith, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So Moses, maybe this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I think it's worth talking about. Moses, powerful man, uh, next ruler of Egypt, uh, widely known and respected. That's Moses. That's that's, uh, Pharaoh's daughter's son. And it says that he refused to be known in that way. Instead, he uh, aligned himself with God and the Israelites. So here's a question that I have. What is the greatest identifier in your life? There's Moses, Pharaoh's daughter's daughter's son. There's Moses, next in line to the throne. There's Moses, the, the, the war general, successful. Who are you? How would you describe yourself? Right, what are you known for? You could say, well, I'm a school teacher. Well, I'm a healthcare worker. Well, I, I'm retired. I'm a husband. I'm a mother, right? A man. I'm a woman. Republican, Democrat. How, how do you, like, what's your number one identifier? We can say a lot of things that are, are true about us, and, and it's amazing that we live in a day and time where we can even say we can identify as things that aren't true about us, and that's accepted. But what is the number one way that you Identify yourself. Moses, it says here, refused to be identified by the things that you would think he would want to cling to. Power, success, next in line to the throne. But instead he, uh, but, but instead it says that he chose rather to be mistreated with the people of God. He was an Israelite. He was one of God's chosen people. And by faith, that's how he identified himself. So I just want to say this, our circumstances, our vocation, our family name, those are not the things that uh, identify us. Those aren't the things that define us. There's no uh, greater way to define yourself or identify than as a child of God. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus' work on the cross, we are, we're children of God. It's the number one way we need to see ourselves. So we know that we are um, undeserving, sinful, rebellious people, but we also know that miraculously we have been redeemed and been made new. Right? The, these are some things that are true about us. We have been forgiven. We've been made righteous with Christ's righteousness. We've been adopted as a son or a daughter of Christ. We have been baptized and been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're the objects of God's love and his grace. We're a recipient of every spiritual blessing. We've been gifted to serve the Lord. Like these are the things that should identify us. 
And Moses says he refused to be identified as a powerful Egyptian. Rather, he chose to be identified as a child of God. And that's, that is so important for us. That's who we are. But it also takes faith. Because our, our society would demand that we identify ourselves in, in all these other ways and not in this way. And first and foremost, we are children of God. We need to be able to see ourselves that way. Verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover, still speaking of Moses, and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. God promised to Moses that he would use Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. Pharaoh said, no way, you're not going anywhere. And so God sent, uh, the, in all he sent 10 plagues. But the first nine plagues, God promised that he was going to do something, and then he did it. And so anyone living at that time vividly saw this, this pattern rep- repeated nine times over. God said he would do something, and then he did it. The, God promised the plague, a plague came. They were devastating. Uh, they were destructive to the, to the people of Egypt and to the land. And so uh, with this, this, this is the 10th plague. Passover came. God said, you're going to kill a lamb. You're going to spread the blood on the doorposts. And those of you who did that, your firstborn will be spared. If you don't do it, your firstborn will die on, on, a, on a given night. And so by faith, what did Moses and the Israelites do? They killed the lamb, they put the blood on the doorpost, and their children were spared. They did it by faith that God would do what he promised to do. And God did exactly that. He delivered them. Continuing, verse 29, By faith the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. After the Passover, the people of Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of here, take anything you want. I don't ever want to see your face again. And so the people of Israel gathered their things up and they left. Um, They were on their way to the promised land. The Red Sea was in front of them though. Pharaoh changed his mind and sent his army after them. So here Moses and maybe a million plus Israelites find themselves the Red Sea is in front of them. They've got all their, they're not armed for battle. They're trying to carry all their belongings and the Egyptian army is coming from behind them. And in Exodus chapter 14, Moses said this to the people. He said, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. That's faith. God had promised that he would take them to the land of Canaan. And Moses He's got a, a, the Red Sea in front of him and an army behind him. And what did he say? God's going to have to do this because there's nothing we can do about it. So he, he says, stand firm, fear not, see the salvation for the Egyptians whom you see today, you'll never see again. And he said in verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. Moses had faith that God was going to do what God promised that he would do. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. I imagine Moses and those, the people of Israel, there, there, was, there was nothing, there was, as they looked at the sea in front of them and the army behind them, victory was not seen. And yet they had faith that God would do what he said he would do. And God did it. Verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. It's 40 years later. They've crossed over into the land of Canaan. They come upon this. The the very first city they come to is the most fortified city in all the land. It's the city of Jericho with uh, thick walls, tall walls, and um, they're preparing for battle. And God says, this is what we're going to do. Once a day for six days, I just want you to march around the city. And then on the seventh day, you're going to march around the city seven times. And once you finish the seventh circuit, you're going, to, uh, you're going to blow the horns, you're going to give up a big shout, and I'll give you the victory. Doesn't sound like a great battle plan uh, to anyone who's got any sort of military experience. 
Uh, But this is what they did in faith that God would do what he said he would do. And on the seventh day, the seventh time around, the trumpets blew, the people shouted, the walls came down, and God gave them the victory. Verse 31. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. When they came up to the city of Jericho before they they took it, they sent spies in. Uh, Two of the spies uh, came to the house of Rahab, who was a Canaanite prostitute, probably uh, had a house in, in the walls. But Rahab had the right understanding of who God is. And you could look at the the account in Joshua chapter 2, but this is some of the things that she said to the spies. She said, I know that the Lord has given this land to you. She said, our hearts have melted because of your presence. And she says this, the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. She says, I know God has done this. I know your God is the God of creation. And she helps them. She provides refuge for them. She helps to give them an escape. She served God through the protection of the Israelites. Essentially, this made her a traitor to her people and her culture. I wonder, would we go so far? Would we stand against our culture to say, I will align with the truth of God's word. This is what Rahab did. She had her, the, the, they had their own gods. They had their own way of life. They had their, uh, the, the, their way of things, that they, the way they like to do it. And here comes God and God's people. And Rahab chose to align herself with God, what was right, what was true, as opposed to just blending in with the culture of the day. Do, do we live according to the changing ways of our world or according to the unchanging truths of God's word? All right, verse 32. You're probably thinking, how many more of these are there? All right, that's, that's what the writer of Hebrews is thinking too. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead from resurrection. He says, I could, just, I, I could keep going, he says. How many more do I have to tell you for you to get this understanding that God is who he says he is, he does what he says he will do, and he can be trusted. We can put our, these men and women put their faith in God, we can put our faith in God, our faith in his word, what he says, what he's promised to us. We kind of uh, touched on this last week. What, what about these ones? This, she, or, uh, he he kind of gives us a list. What about Gideon? He asked God to jump through like multiple hoops before he would agree to believe him. What about uh, Barak? He wouldn't go into battle unless Deborah went with him. What about Samson? He seemed more interested in women than doing what God wanted him to do. Jephthah, David, these, they, they all had serious shortcomings. But I think there's an interesting phrase here, uh, also in verse 34. They were made strong out of weakness. They had shortcomings. They weren't perfect. Hallelujah. Like, we can relate to that, right? But they were made strong out of weakness. And it reminds me what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he's describing um, here, he says, but he said to me, so it, God said to, to Paul is, what's, is what we're reading, 
This is what God said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul speaking again, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest in me. When we are weak, he is strong. We quote that verse fairly often because that's a great, that is an encouraging verse. When you feel weak, when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel insufficient, when you feel like you just don't have it, his power is made perfect in our weakness. A great verse, but it continues this way. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insult, hardship, persecutions, calamities, For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul actually says, I invite these things into my life because this is when I know God will work most powerfully through me. I don't know if invite is the right word. uh, That was my word, okay? (laughs) He says he's content. He will accept it. He says, if this is what God has, if this is for God, if if this is what it takes for God to get the most glory, then I'm content with that. We wouldn't need Christ's power if we could just do it on our own. So we should expect that we will find ourselves in situations that are just too big for us. We can't handle on our own. We don't know what to do, because in those situations, it's when Christ works powerfully within us. So speaking of difficulties, calamities, weakness, look, continue to read with me in Hebrews chapter 11, the second part of 35. He's saying, look, I could keep going about all these people. And he's, he's listed a bit, uh, the, some of those who had great triumphs, but then he says this, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mockings and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. I was looking at this list, and that's brutal. I, I, was, I was just trying to look and think, that, like, are there, is there anything on this list we could even relate to? Uh, maybe maybe uh, uh, afflicted and mistreated. Well, we, we live a blessed life, don't we? I'm not saying perfect and, and everything's... It, but I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, especially if we look at world history, not uh, just the, our lifetime or your li- my lifetime or your lifetime, if we look at the history of the world, if we look at the reality of our world today, we live a blessed life. I don't even know how often we think about these things. I don't think of them often. We have uh, coming to the missions conference this weekend. Actually, I think he arrives Wednesday evening with his family's uh, uh, Pastor Vijay from India. And some of you uh, were here when he was with us probably six or seven years ago. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Vijay lives a life of persecution. He has been beaten for his faith. He has been put in jail for his faith. He is constantly harassed because of his faith. We just just don't find ourselves in those kinds of situations. But this is my prayer. That any sort of harassment, any sort of mistreatment, any sort of slight, any sort of discrimination that we might face because of the name of Jesus... we would be like Paul. We'd be content with that to bring glory to his name. That we would have faith that no matter the circumstance we find ourselves in, that we know that he loves us. 
that he's with us. And that we would have uh, faith, so much faith that we would continue to be obedient to the glory of God no matter the outcome. Verse 39. And all of these, whether they experience triumph or whether they uh, experience persecution even to death, all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. So I think he's, he's trying to sort of wrap things up and point out a couple of things. These ones, even the ones that had great triumph, they didn't experience fully the things that they believed for. I think he's referring to uh, they never, the Messiah didn't come in the lifetime of these that are listed in this, in this chapter. And I, and I say that because he says, since God had provided something better for us. Well, what's something better that we have that the Old Testament saints didn't have? Jesus, the Messiah. So, so I think this is what he's referring to. They never saw the Messiah. And they also never saw on this earth anyways, that heavenly home, that better country, that city of gold that they were waiting for, that we're waiting for. So in a sense, we are waiting together with the saints of old for this, for this promise of something to come. Um, the return of Christ, when all things will be made new, all things will be restored, all things will be set right, the dwelling place of God will be with man. And until that day, we're called to have faith in the promises of God. Do we believe what God says? And do we live like we believe what God says? Faith isn't a, a mysterious thing that we have to find or that we have to muster up within ourselves. God has revealed to us through his word things that are true, things that are right, things that we are to live by. And so faith is believing that those things are true. And, it, and I think there's a believing to the point of conviction, to the point that we live according to what is true and according to what is right. And we're constantly adjusting ourselves as we see, uh, our, see ourselves stray, as we see ourselves wander, adjusting ourselves to what is true and to what is right, and aligning ourselves with God's word. The great thing is that God, through the Holy Spirit, enables us to do it. So as we close this morning, I wonder, is there a, a situation in your life that is burdening you, that is concerning to you, that is bigger than what you can handle, that you've kind of been consumed with, that you've been praying about? Maybe if you just bow your heads with me. I'd like for you to, 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 to we'll do a little exercise. So I'd like for you to uh, pick a situation in your life. If you've been praying about it, perfect. If, it, if, if, if you're concerned about it, if, you're, um, if it's looming, you maybe you haven't prayed about it yet, and this would be a great time to do that. So here's a couple questions. Have something in your mind, and let me ask you this. What truths about God apply to your situation? What truths about God apply to your situation? And then let me ask you this question. What truths from God's word about how we should live and interact with people apply to your situation? All right, so thinking about this, this concerning thing that you have, what truths about God apply? What truths about what God's word says about how we live and how we interact with people? How do, how did that, what are some that apply to your situation? So let me give you 
Uh, for example, Sarah and I, we've been, we've been praying uh, for Nate and Court, our sons, young adults now. They're, uh, they've been working through applying for jobs. They've been seeking the Lord, trying to determine you know, what the next years of their life will look like based on this employment that they're looking for. What truths about God apply to this situation? Well, we know that in the Old Testament, God reveals himself as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. In the New Testament, we know that Paul wrote to the Philippians, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory. So as, as we pray about this situation, I would say, God, I'm just so thankful that you provide for all of our needs. You are Jehovah Jireh. You're the one that provides. You're the one that sustains. You're the one that cares for us. And God, I trust that you're going to care for Nate and Court. I trust that just as you have provided for my needs, that you will provide for their needs according to your will, according to your riches. So God, I have faith that you will provide for my sons. But I also know that as they are looking at different opportunities and trying to explore different things, they're, they're asking questions. Well, I don't know, what about this job? What about this opportunity? Should I apply for here? Should I apply there? Should I talk to this person? And God, I know that your word says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. And so God, on behalf of Nate and Court, I ask that you would give them wisdom. I pray that they would seek you for understanding. I pray that they would look to you for direction. And God, I'm confident because your word says it that you give them wisdom that they need to have for this situation. You might say, well, <laughs> Pastor Jeff, I don't even, I don't, I don't even know where to start with my, the, the, the circumstances that I'm dealing with. And that's okay. God will, will reveal to you. Sometimes the, the best thing to do is to ask a friend. Ask one of the elders or one of the pastors, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. Where can I go to in God's word that, that, that I can, what, what can I read about God? What can I learn about God that applies to this situation? How has he instructed me as a believer, as a follower of Christ, to deal with these kinds of things? And we can encourage one another through, through the word of God because it's real, it's true, it applies to our lives today. Father, I th I'm thankful for your word this morning. I'm thankful for the truth that's in it. I'm thankful that um, I can have faith that you are who you say you are and you do what you say you'll do. And Lord, I pray that as I deal with uh, life situations and circumstances that I'm not just asking for the things that I want but I'm believing the things that you said that apply to my circumstance Lord I pray that we would always come to you through the filter of, of truth and of reality and that I would be seeking to align myself with, with you not just using you to get to where I want to go. There's, that's, not what you've, that's not what you've promised to us. And so, God, I pray that we would just continually align ourselves with your word, the truth that's in it, who you are, and that we would have faith that you'll do the things that you promised to do. Thank you for loving us, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.